I'm highly blessed and highly favored. In spite of all, I was able to celebrate my 59th birthday this past Saturday, which I never thought I would see that. I can't believe this has happened to me for a second time. The first time I became disabled, I was 19 years old, still a student athlete, picture of great health, vitality. I maintained a healthy lifestyle, and I leaned on those values that I learned as an athlete, being disciplined and having dedication. Little did I know that many years later, as a 56-year-old, I'd have to count on those values and dedication to live life. As a 19-year-old, one night while traveling back to college to play in a spring football game, I was hit by a drunk driver. Because I was in a coma for two weeks, when I came out of coma, I had no memory of the accident or that one of my friends was traveling with me had got killed that night. When I woke up with tubes and all those things running out of my body and I'm in this strange place trying to figure out what am I doing. And the last thing I remember, I was driving a vehicle, and I recognized faces and all that, and I still didn't, still didn't gather that I was in the hospital. Once I was able to leave the hospital and go back home, the doctors never told me that there was a possibility that I, I would never walk in. One of my friends and teammates came by, he thought I already knew that my best friend had got killed in a wreck and um, that, I, that I was, already knew that I wasn't going to be able to walk again. But I had no idea. I really didn't believe him. I was kind of taken aback from what he said. Now, although it happened many years ago, it's, it's still a memory that's embedded um, that you live with the rest of your life. Um, my mom has shared with me, because I didn't remember any of this, that in February 24th, 1984, um, as a student athlete, I was, I was traveling back with my friends for that spring football game when we got hit by the drunk driver, and that they received a call about 2 a.m. in the morning. My dad was in the Air Force. And that's a call that you never want to get as a parent. And they told my parents, not that I was injured, but I was dead. So my mom and dad got to the hospital. It turned out it was my best friend because we had been playing basketball earlier that day. I went back to visit my old high school. So he had my wallet and stuff in his back pocket. So that was, I guess, somewhat of a relief in some kind of ways. Um, but then they were told that there were two other young men that were in two separate hospitals that had received permanent injuries, and one of those individuals happened to be me. I celebrate my parents because my sister and I always taught as children to believe in prayer and have faith. My spirit, I believe, would allow me to walk again. During this journey, I thought of suicide, but my faith was too strong, and I had the, deter I had the determination to live. I prayed and continued to believe that I would prove the doctors wrong. My 11th grade home ec teacher, most of you don't even know what home ec is, but that's how, that's how old I am. We had home ec. <laughs> or you learn to cook and bake and all those things. Uh, one of my teachers came to visit me, and when she got ready to leave my, my home, um, just out the blue, I, I told Ms. Brown I was going to get up and walk out with her. Um, my mom and some of her church friends were praying in the living room, and Ms. Brown just looked at me like, this is not going to happen. So I put my hand out. She gave me her hand. I leaned on her shoulders, and I stood up. You know, I had lost all the mobility in my legs, and my skin was peeling and all those things. And I walked into the room with Ms. Brown, and the, the, fake, the looking at my mom and her friend's face was priceless. But it wasn't unexpected because she already believed it, and I believed it. I had a team of doctors at the Medical University of South Carolina, and when I walked in, they couldn't believe it. They said, there's no way possible he's walking after what he's been through. I had plastic surgery and all these other different things, and they called it a miracle. That was the first time in my life where my faith 
had really been tested, but I believed. The only thing I wanted to do, if I was ever able to walk again, because athletics was over, I wanted the ability to be able to pick a basketball just one more time. And I prayed, and I, and I said, if I can ever have the ability to pick up a basketball one more time, then I would change as a person, and I would spend my life trying to make the difference in the lives of others. A few years after I got healed, I kept that promise. I created Project Life Foundation, Incorporated. It's a national organization. It's 34 years old. Helps young people, underserved communities, black and brown, Caucasian, Asian, to, so that they understand how to make positive decisions in life and put in themselves in better positions. And our tagline is helping people today for a stronger people tomorrow. Today I stand before you not as a victim of circumstance, but as, assist, but as a symbol of triumph over adversity. In March of 2020, I was walking my dog to the mailbox, and all of a sudden, I couldn't move. Never understood why. As I stood there waving, it started raining, and neighbors were just driving past. I guess they thought I was waving at them, but I, I, I couldn't move. And because I still had my faculties, some said, just lay on the ground, crawl up. I crawled up, rang the doorbell. My youngest son was home at the time, and, and my wife and my son called EMS. And I heard, the, I heard the EMT tell my wife that I had suffered a stroke. And I'm like, really? I was in pretty good health. You know, I didn't hang out. I didn't drink or smoke a whole lot. I don't smoke at all. None of that, and just bam, it hit me. In the mix of it all, it was the middle of COVID. So I'm in the hospital, can't see my wife, can't see my children, can't see my dogs. I'm in a hazmat suit. People are scared to touch me. I'm quarantined for two weeks. When I finally get to see people, the doctor comes in and says, do you want to live or die? And I'm like, <laughs> what a question. I, I told the doctor I wanted to live, and I had a reason to live. I, I didn't believe my journey here on earth was done, and I wanted to be here for my wife and my family. The stroke robbed me of my ability to walk, speak, clearly maintain my balance, even perform basic tasks like taking a bath, tying my shoes, using the restroom or getting dressed. Even today, it's hard for me to get dressed. I can't drive at night, but I've accepted those disabilities. Or when I pull in the Home Depot, if it's daylight, or any other business, and I park in handicap, people just look like, what is he doing? He's, there's nothing wrong with him. And you get those looks, and, and you're like, OK, I wonder who's going to knock on the window and say something crazy at some point. <laughs> so I had to live with the fact that I I had a disability that wasn't going anywhere. I can't run. I can't jump. I can hardly lift my arm. But in spite of it all, I'm still here. When I was in the hospital and they brought in the wheelchair, that's when it really hit home. And I said to myself, I'm not going to be refined to a wheelchair. So. They had these little sensors on the wheelchair and the bathroom and all these things. And at night, I would get to the handles of the wheelchair and push it. I'd fall down, get back up, fall down, get back up. I started crawling and walking myself and grabbing the rod in the, in the shower and pulling myself up, taking my own showers and all of that. I got caught a couple times and got a stern lecture. And I kept calling, <laughs> kept calling my wife saying, I'm ready to go home. Because it was killing me being there. But I knew it was something in a reason, because my faith had always said things happen for a reason. When I got back home, got through uh, rehab and all those things, um, I was over the Greenville region for the South Carolina Department of Commerce about 17 years, and no one on my board knew that I had suffered a stroke, because I kept it private. So when we had our first meeting, we were on a computer screen, 
They thought everything was fine until my boy just told them I had a stroke and they couldn't believe it. I was just happy to be back amongst people and have some semblance of life. But in the midst of all that, that's only part of it. I started walking, trying to get my blood pressure right, my heart rate right, all these different things. And in the middle of, 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 of doing that, I was going on my daily morning walk at 7.30 in the morning. And I saw the police when they drove past. And my spirit said, they're stopping for you. And I'm like, why, why would he be stopping for me? Ten minutes later, when he turned around and stopped, he got out the car, and I looked at him. He looked at me. This is in the middle of George Floyd and all of that, and I'm from Charleston, and we never had those type of relationships. So when he stopped, I asked him, why did he stop me? I was shocked and amazed that a neighbor called and said a suspicious black male walking in the neighborhood. I thought I had accomplished so much in life that I was immune to all of that. But I learned quickly just because I had a degree and position and all that, it didn't change how people view you in the world. But again, in spite of it all, I was over, able to overcome the challenges and the barriers. People with disabilities have shown time and time again that they only overcome missed challenges, but also influence the world in profound ways. With leaders, with directors, with doctors and lawyers, with your neighbors, with your teammates, with your family members. Our perspectives and experiences enrich society and drive innovation. Yes, society sometimes judges people solely based on what they can see, overlooking the incredible potential that we have within. I make decisions every day that affect not only people in Greenville and the state of South Carolina, but I have a disability. And I'm proud of the fact that I do have a disability and over to serve as that individual that people can look to and say, you know what, I can strive irregardless. It's important to remember that appearances can be deceiving. Every disability is not recognizable. We must look beyond the surface to truly understand the depth of an individual's ability and contributions Disabilities don't define us. It's our determination and resilience that truly define who we are. My challenge to you is today, I encourage all of you to see the potential in every individual, regardless of their physical abilities. Never judge a book by its cover because you never know where it's been. Let us dispel the negative myths and stereotypes surrounding disabilities. Instead, focus on the incredible strengths and talents that lie within each person. Remember that our limitations are only defined by the barriers we set ourselves. Together we can break those barriers, redefine what's possible, inspire others to rise above the challenges. Let's embrace diversity in all forms and recognize immense potential that resides in every individual, regardless of who they are, where they came from, their economic background, their race, to build a better and more inclusive, compassionate society that's resilient for all. Thank you. Thank you.